I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. God is good. And all the time. Psalm 100 verse 5, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening to those of you online, wherever you are on God's green earth. Thank you so much for joining us as we continue in such a time like this here in the Pasadena SDA Church in Southern California. Is there anyone with us tonight? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. You are with us for the very first time. May I see your hand? First time. You are not, a, okay, first time, we have one in the back. Would you kindly tell us your name? Would someone shout it for me? Annie? Spell it. Oh, that's it. Oh, Ani. Hi, Ani. Forgive my sins. How are you? Where are you from? Where? Oh, Glendale. Okay. Now, Ani, who invited you? Yes, he's a handsome man. I like him a lot. Thank you very much, Ani, for coming. I really mean that sincerely. And may the Lord bless you. I also believe there are guests online. You are not Seventh-day Adventists. We welcome you with just as much sincerity as we've welcomed Annie. Annie, I will pray for you right now and ask God to bless you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Dear God in heaven, you gave life to Annie. Your spirit led her to come, and we are grateful, and so are you. In the name of Jesus Christ who died for her and who loves her, bless her life. Wherever she has a need, dear God, Respond to that need in such abundance that she will know that the God of creation has moved in her life. Make her a blessing to others, I pray. Remember all our guests online, I pray the same for them. And if they have children, dear God, put a double blessing on their children, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's believing people say, Amen and Amen. God bless Sister Annie. 
Our subject for this evening, a high and holy honor. What did I say? A high and holy honor. If you are not using one of these things, let me remind you to turn them off. I believe this one is off so that nothing rings while we're worshiping the God of heaven and earth. That's favor number one, to preserve reverence. The second favor I ask is that you pray for me while I'm speaking. All I want you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. I also think of the promise that God made to Moses in Exodus chapter 4 verse 12 when God said to him, Now therefore go, I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. I want God to do that for me. And favor number three, think as you listen. Isaiah 118, come now, let us do what? Reason together, saith the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we come into your presence because you have invited us to come boldly to the throne of grace. And so we come at your invitation. We also come because Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Please, God, the rest we need more than anything else is rest from sin. If we've offended you, forgive us, dear God, and place into our hearts a hatred for sin and a love for righteousness. I ask you to grant us your spirit. He is the spirit of truth that he may guide our minds into truth, Father. Bless Sister Ani, our guests in a very special way, and all those guests online. Dear God, I humble myself before you. You sent this invitation to me. I did not seek it. And so I ask you to be with me, Father. Guide my mind. Guide my tongue. Fill my heart with the humility of Christ and take my carnal nature by the throat and choke it into submission. That your glory becomes my only business. If anyone listening to me is sick, put your hand of healing on that person, dear God. And Father, bless this country of the United States of America. Guide the minds of the leaders, Father, that the decisions they make may be advantageous to the spread of the gospel. Bless every other country represented by those who are watching. Now, dear God, take full control, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. What's our subject? A high and holy honor. Go with me to Matthew chapter 5. We'll read from verse 20 of Matthew 5. I have about 16 minutes to 8. I'll release you by 8.30. Matthew chapter 5. Reading from verse 20. Well, let's read from 17. Let's read from 17 because some people need to hear 17 over and over again. When you found it, say amen. amen. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, finish that, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot, or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, which means little things mean a lot to God, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do, which means obey, and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Let me pause on that and digress briefly. Jesus says, those who preach the law of God and encourage others to obey the law of God will be regarded in the kingdom of God as great. Those who deny the law of God and mislead others into disobedience will be regarded as the least. And there are too many preachers who dismiss the law of God and encourage others not to obey God's law. Verse 20, for I say unto you, 
that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. We must read verse 20 again. For I say unto you, that except, except your righteousness shall exceed. Help me with the English. Give me another word for exceed or another expression. Surpass. What was that? Increase. Go, beyond. Go beyond. Increase beyond. Yes. Surpass. Above and beyond. Accept your righteousness. And Christ is speaking to the disciples. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Now the multitudes are listening, but Christ went to the mount to speak to his disciples. Matthew 5, verse 1 and 2. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. The Sermon on the Mount is for God's people. No unconverted person can live that life. If any man will compel you to go a mile, go with him twain. That requires conversion. If any shall smite you on thy right cheek, turn to him the other. That requires conversion. And so when Jesus is speaking, he tells the disciples, his followers, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed. The righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. What did Christ mean by exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Christ does not believe in leaving us confused. So he gives us examples of righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Let's get example 1, verse 21, chapter 5, Matthew, our subject, a high and holy honor. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Now Jesus takes the commandment 6, Thou shalt not kill, and he lifts it above what the Pharisees and the scribes taught. Now what Christ said on the mount is exactly what he meant on Mount Sinai. I'm talking to myself this early in the message. What Christ is explaining is what he meant on Sinai. By the way, it was the voice of Christ that spoke the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. But the instant Adam sinned, the father no longer had direct communication. That's why there's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. It was Christ who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. It was Christ who appeared to Abraham as he sat in his tent. It was Christ who followed them through the wilderness. It was Christ. And so Christ says, if you are angry without a cause, you have broken what commandment? The one that says what? Thou shalt not kill. For the Pharisees, as long as you do not kill someone physically, you're all right. But Jesus takes his disciples to the spiritual level of the law. Don't tear down people's reputation. You're killing them. Don't carry a grudge against someone. That's murder. And the closest disciple to Christ, John, writing in 1 John 3, 15, he said, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. In other words, we have to be careful. Am I angry with someone without a cause? If I am, I am an active murderer in the eyes of God. But the secular powers won't touch you. Let me tell you something. What keeps you out of prison on earth will put you in prison in heaven. Because God's standards are higher than earthly standards. Are you following me? 
Let's go to verse 27 and look at another example of righteousness that exceeds. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. For the Pharisees, as long as there was no physical contact, there was no adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever, come on, read with me, looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already. Where? In a motel? Where? In his heart. Now that is a righteousness that goes way beyond. What I want you to observe is that when Christ said, except your righteousness shall exceed, he gives an example of excessive righteousness. And where does he go for that? I, I almost jumped when you began to speak. You thought you had it. <laughs> You're on the right street, but we need the right house. Where did Christ go when he gave the examples? To the commandments. Yes. The commandments of God represent excessive righteousness. Are you with me? The commandments of God express the highest level of righteousness possible. The very righteousness, finish my words, of God. Let's stay with Jesus. Let's go to Luke chapter 10. Our subject, a high and holy honor. Luke 10, we read from verse 25. Luke was a medical doctor. He was not one of the 12 disciples that followed Christ all over Galilee. Neither was Mark, by the way. Do you have Luke 10? We read from verse 25. Let me pray again. Father, continue to be with me today, God, please, because I am flesh. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, What shall I do, finish the verse, to inherit, what? Eternal life. He said unto him, What is written where? In the law. What, how readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. What is he summarizing? The Ten Commandments. And he said unto him, what? Thou hast what? Answered. Mm -hmm, finish it. This do. Come on. What did he mean by thou shalt live? Because the man was already living. What life is he referring to? Eternal life. What was the question the lawyer posed? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus Christ connected eternal life to his law. Someone living in obedience to God's law by the power of God is expressing eternal life. Even on this earth. I have to say that again. Maybe I said it clumsily. Anyone living in obedience to God's Ten Commandments by the power of God, that's the only way, is expressing eternal life. Amen. Let's stay with Jesus. Let's go to Matthew, Luke 18. We read from verse 18. What's our subject? A high and holy honor. You're probably wondering, what is that honor? We'll get to that. Oh, I see a clock right in front of me right here, 7.53. All right. I appreciate it. What book did I say? Luke, what chapter? 18, reading from verse 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The same question that the lawyer asked in Luke 10, 25. Same question, same words. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. Now what was the young ruler's question? You tell me. What shall I do, come on, to inherit eternal life? What was the lawyer's question? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Where did God send the lawyer to the law? He said, what's written in the law? What does Jesus say to the rich young ruler? Thou knowest the commandments. 
Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. Jesus pointed them to the law. He wants us to understand there is a condition to eternal life. That condition is obedience. Someone may say, no, the condition is faith. Well, no one can argue against faith. But the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth or has faith should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, let me ask you this. When you exercise faith, who told you to exercise faith? Come on. Who told you? God's word. God told you exercise faith because without faith it is in to please God so God tells you you want to please me exercise faith now when you exercise faith have you obeyed yes or no yes are you with me when you exercise faith you are obeying God who has asked you and me to exercise faith obedience is the condition of salvation because no man no woman can be saved against his or her will let's leave Luke and Matthew let's go to Paul the second greatest teacher on the face of the earth after Christ let's go to Romans 7 we read verse 7 our subject a high and holy honor do you have Romans 7 let's read verse 7 if you have my version, you may read with me, even though you never do, but that's okay. I'll keep asking you. One day you'll surprise me before this weekend ends on Sabbath. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said what? Where is Paul quoting from? the Ten Commandments. He does not need to name all in order to tell us he's referring to the Ten Commandments. Let me explain what I mean. If I were to say to you, I want you to identify a particular state in the United States, I'll give you some cities as clues. Are you with me? And I were to say, San Diego, Pasadena, Camarillo, El Segundo, do I need to name every city in California? No. Well, if we can be that reasonable at a human level, what about God at the divine level? He does not need to name all commandments for you and me. Being reasonable to conclude he's referring to the Ten Commandments. Let's stay with Paul. Let's go to Romans 13. Our subject, a high and holy calling. It is 8 o'clock, much to my surprise. That thing says 758, so I'll go by that and not my watch. <laughs> Let the church say amen. <laughs> okay. Where did I say? Romans chapter 1. Let's read from verse 8. You have that? Father in heaven, continue to instruct me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now read verse 9. What does that say? For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not what? Thou shalt not honor thy father, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Where is Paul quoting from? Ten commandments. I want you to look at eight again. Owe no man anything but to love one another. Listen to me carefully. The greatest favor you can do your fellow man is to live a right life. I'll give you a few seconds to meditate on that. Now, you will agree. The greatest disfavor people can do is to live a criminal life. So you don't want the mass murderer living next to you. You don't want the child molester in your church. Are you following me? 
the greatest favor you and I can do to each other is to live a Christ-like life. And so the Bible says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. What is this love? Obedience to God's law. The safest person to be around is a law-abiding person. Let me identify what law I mean, the law of God. Let's leave, Brother Paul. Let's go to the brother of Jesus. As we continue, a high and holy calling, a high and holy honor. James chapter 2, we'll read from verse 8. Do you have James? James is called the Proverbs of the New Testament. James chapter 2, reading from verse 8. The Bible says, If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep what? The whole law, and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. Now read verse 11 for me. For he that said what? Do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now where is James quoting from? The Ten Commandments. Let's review. Matthew 5, Jesus said, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. And he gives two examples, murder and adultery. Where did he quote from? The Ten Commandments. The rich young ruler, Luke 18, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, thou knowest the commandments, and he quotes from the 10. The lawyer, Luke 10, verse 25, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, what's written in the law? And the lawyer summarizes the 10. Romans chapter 7, what shall we say then is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. What law? The ceremonial law? No. He gives us an example. Thou shalt not covet the Ten Commandments. We go to Romans 13. Owe no man anything but to love one another. Then he gives us an example of how that love is expressed. Do not commit adultery. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Don't covet the Ten Commandments. We have Jesus. We have Paul, we have James, testifying to the central role of the law of God in the life of the believer. Let me make a sweeping statement. This world is in trouble because God's law has been ignored. Let me say it differently. This world is in trouble because the righteousness of Christ in the law has been ignored. Let's go to our scripture reading, Romans 8. Let's read from verse 1. Our subject, a high and holy honor, and I will get to that momentarily. Do you have Romans 8? Our scripture reading, we read from verse 1. And when I go too quickly, you're supposed to tell me, slow down. You haven't done it yet. You're so nice and disobedient. Romans 8, reading from verse 1. Do you have that? There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemn sin in the flesh. Finish the quotation for me, verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. I want you to see the connection between the Spirit and the law. Anyone who walks in the Spirit will obey the law of God. Listen again. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who is us? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The law of God is the lifestyle of someone led by the spirit. Because it was the spirit that wrote the law on the, ten, on the tables of stone. Let me say it again. Maybe I get an amen the second time. It was the Spirit of God 
that wrote the Ten Commandments on the two tables of stone. But as good Bible students, you want Bible evidence. All right. Let us go to Exodus 31. This is a brief diversion, or digression, I should call it. 805. I have 25 minutes to explain what the high and holy honor is. Do you have Exodus 31, verse 18? Are you there? Some of you still looking? You have five seconds. <laughs> okay. You have it now? And he gave unto Moses. Read with me. When he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, what? Two tables of? Come on. Tables of stone written how? With the finger of God. Now, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, which one? Let us go to Luke chapter 11. I like Luke. Luke is very practical. There's another book in the Bible Luke wrote. What book is that? The book of Acts, yes. Mm -hmm. he wrote, and those two books combined make up about one quarter of the entire New Testament. There are two big books. Luke 11, verse 20. Do you have it? Now read with me. But if I, what? With the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. But if I with the finger of God, that's what, now this is Jesus speaking, if I cast out devils with the finger of God, or the same finger that wrote the Ten Commandments. But now let's go to Matthew 12 and listen to Matthew reporting the same event. He uses slightly different words. Matthew 12, verse 28. Our subject, a high and holy honor. Do you have Matthew 12? Remember, Matthew is recording the very same incident that Luke wrote about, but he just uses different phraseology. Verse 28, but if I, what? Cast out devils, how? Ah, what does Matthew say? Come on, what does Matthew say? By the Spirit, what does Luke say? What is the finger of God? The Spirit of God. Now, let's strengthen that. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We read verse 3. Second Corinthians 3, verse 3, our subject, a high and holy honor. Do you have it? Now, read with me. What does that say? For as much as you manifestly declared to be what? The epistles of? In other words, we are like books that people read. Let's be sure they read the right stuff. Are you following me? We are books by our lifestyle that people read. For as much as he manifestly declared to be the epistles of Christ, keep reading, ministered by us. Now read carefully. Go on. Written, not within, come on. With the spirit of the living God. Yes, keep reading. Not in tables of stone, but on fleshy tables of the heart. Now, we have two kinds of tables. Tables of stone, tables of the heart. Paul is saying the spirit writes it on the tables of the heart. Now, we found out from Matthew 11, 12, 28 and Luke eleven twenty that this finger of God is the spirit of God. Here Paul is telling us that spirit that wrote the law on stone now writes the law where? On our hearts. Now, having said all of that, let us go back to Romans chapter 8. We read verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled where? In us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Remove the spirit and the law isn't there. Remove the law and the spirit isn't there. Because the power that wrote God's law is the power of the Spirit of God. Jesus spoke it. The Father requested that it be spoken. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the law of God. Now, why is the subject a high and holy honor? Go to Romans chapter 3. We've seen the central role of the law. We can't escape it. Jesus lifted it up. Paul lifted it. James lifted it. 
Romans 3. Let's read verse 23. You don't have to look. You can read it without looking. Come on, say it nice and clear. For all have sinned. Stop. 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 S-T-O-P. Stop. For all have sinned. Now, what is sin? The trans That's 1 John 3, 4. Now, read now. Give me the Pasadena version. For all have transgressed the law. And because of that, finish the verse. They come short of the glory of God. Well, if transgressing God's law brings you short of the glory of God, reverse that. What does obedience do? It brings you, it makes you a reflector of the glory of God. For all have sinned. All have broken the law of God. That's the only way to sin, by the way. There is no way to sin unless you violate one of God's commandments. And the Bible says you break one, come on, you break all. All have broken God's law. And because of that, disobedience causes us to fall short of the glory of God. And the glory of God is the righteousness of God. The very character of God is the glory of God. Let us see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Our subject, a high and holy honor. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. 11 minutes after 8. We have 19 minutes to go. Do you have 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18? Father in heaven, continue to be with me. I truly and sincerely ask in Jesus' name, amen. Read with me. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, what? The glory of the Lord. Stop. We behold, of course, the only way to behold God's glory is to look at Jesus. Ah, you didn't get it. The only way to know God is to study Jesus. You cannot know God the Father unless you study Jesus. It is Christ that makes the Father known. Are you with me? He that have seen me have seen the Father. But we all with open face, beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord, keep reading now, are changed into the same image of the same glory. Meaning image and glory are the same thing. are changed into the same image by beholding and beholding. And it is impossible to behold Jesus unless you study his life. You don't behold Christ by looking at the Bible. You behold Christ by studying his life. And to understand Christ, you must study from Genesis, come on, to Revelation. Because he is the word. The word is more than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The word is Genesis to Revelation. But we all with open face Beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, growing and growing and growing, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. The glory of God is a character of God. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the? Glory. Say it differently, all have sinned and come short of the? Character of God. Now let's make a comprehensive change, but the same meaning, for all have transgressed the law and come short of the character of God, which means the character of God is expressed in the law of God. Now, let us go to Romans 2. Romans 2. We read from verse 17. Romans chapter 2, reading from verse 17. Are you with me? Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. What verse 18 is saying, to know right and wrong, one must go to the law. Somebody say something. <laughs> It is the law that determines right and wrong. And so Paul says, and knows his will, verse 18, and approves or decides what is the best, the superior, different from the fake, by going to the law which instructs. 
and are confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and of the truth where in the law. Thou therefore, which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not what? Dost thou steal? Where is Paul going? The law. Thou that sayest a man should not what? Commit adultery, thus thou commit adultery. Thou that abhorrest idols, thus thou commit sacrilege. We have three laws that Paul refers to. What are the three? Don't worship idols, commandment two. Don't commit adultery, commandment seven. And don't kill, commandment six. Or don't steal, commandment eight, sorry. Paul goes to the law. Now, we know he's referring to the Ten Commandments. Listen to verse 23. Thou that makest thy boast of the law. Hmm? Through what? Breaking the law, finish the verse, dishonorest thou God? Now, when your child goes to school and you pay thousands of dollars of tuition at La Sierra or Loma Linda or Pasadena University, the child brings home a, a grade report with D and E and F and G and H. <laughs> you know, alphabet soup. <laughs> Are you honored, yes or no? you disgraced. You don't want the neighbors to know. You know, have you ever seen those cars with a bumper sticker, I'm the mother of an honor student? Have you ever seen that? Yeah. You would love to drive with that bumper sticker, but your child flunked gloriously. <laughs> and so you want to move to Anchorage. Are you following me? Because you're so embarrassed. You have been dishonored. Now listen to what Paul says. Verse 23, Romans 2. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, finish the verse, dishonorest thou God. What's the opposite of dishonoring God? Honoring God. What's our subject? A high and holy honor. Now, we have been chosen by God to honor him by doing what? Obeying his law. Because if we dishonor God, verse 23, Romans 2, by breaking the law, turn that around. We honor God by obeying his law, by his power. Now read verse 24. For the name of God, come on, is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. You and I have been given the honor of making sure that God gets what? A good name on this earth. Yes, you and I have been called by God to give God a good name by obedience to his law because disobedience to his law dishonors God, disgraces God, and the Bible says in the eyes of the Gentiles. For the name of God is blasphemed. That God is a drunk God. That God smokes. That God has many, many girlfriends at the same time. That God gambles. <laughs> because that's what his people do. But when we obey God, ah, and the heathens see us, they serve a God who believes in honesty. They serve a God that does not steal. They serve a God who forgives because they forgive. They serve a God who's always on time. Say amen. Yeah. <laughs> no colored people stand with God. We serve a God who's always on time. The heathen will see God in us. But this was always God's desire. Genesis 126, let us make man how? In our image, so that everything Adam and Eve did was intended to reflect God. Even after sin, that didn't change. Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1072, paragraph 8. Ellen White writes, why cannot those who claim to understand the scriptures see that God's requirement under grace is just the same he made in Eden, 
perfect obedience to his law. What does she mean by Eden and under grace? Before sin, God required obedience. After sin, same thing. You see, when you and I obey, the first person to benefit is God. We have to learn to think of God first. Say the, Lord, uh, the psalm, the, the shepherd psalm with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Now carefully, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Stop. What are the paths of righteousness? The law of God. <laughs> now finish the verse. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Come on. For his name's sake. Not yours. Your obedience is first for the glory of God. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God's glory is priority number one. And that is accomplished by his indwelling power when we live in harmony with the standard of righteousness, the law of God. You see, the life of Christ was a practical example of the law of God. Christ's life is the law of God with shoes and a robe. Are you listening to me? Amen. We have been given a high and holy honor Amen. to glorify God, give him a good name. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 to 16. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Finish with me. Let your light, let what? Your light. So shine before men, the heathen, that they may see your life, your good works, and finish it now. Glorify your Father, not you. The reason for an upright life is that it glorifies God and silences Satan who charged God with having a law that cannot be kept. You and I must demonstrate to the universe, no, 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 no. God's law expresses his very righteousness, but there is a way for a sinner to keep that law. When I say a sinner, a sinner who's given the life to Christ. Mm-hmm. You and I can live, <laughs> you know, God is a parent who really loves us. You can tell if your parent loves you by the standards your parent sets for you. Amen. If your mother sent you to school and your father said, son, it's okay if you get D's and E's, we'll be proud. <laughs> Those parents don't like you. Are you with me? <laughs> they don't like you. <laughs> now, God could have said, Adam and Eve, Randy Skid, Pastor Mike, you can live like Al Capone. It's okay. Jack the Ripper, it's okay. Attila the Hunt. But what God has done to show his love, he has given us a standard that is so high. Hmm? Which is his very character. He said, that's the standard for you. That's how much I think of you, says God. And so Ella White writes, education, page 18, paragraph 4, higher than the highest human thought can reach, is God's ideal for his children. Godliness. Godlikeness. You and I can never be God, but we're called upon to be godly. There's only one Christ, but we're called upon to be Christ-like. When this is accomplished in us with our cooperation, ongoing cooperation through daily surrender, the end result is the glory of God. When God called Abraham, Genesis 12 from verse 1, you need not go there. Now the Lord has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great. God told Abraham, I will give you a good name. The implication was, now Abraham, if you obey me, you will give me, come on, a good name. 
When you set out to make a name for yourself, you come into conflict with God. It is God's business to give you a good name. It is your business, come on, tell me, to give God a good name. How many of you will say, Father, help me to so live that your goodness is seen in my life. Can I see your hand? Hands down. How many will say, Father, give me a greater appreciation for your law of righteousness. Can I see your hand? Stand with me. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Dear God, thank you for the simplicity of your word. If it's read honestly and with an open mind guided by your spirit. Thank you, Father, for the law. Because the law is life. When the lawyer and a rich young ruler asked Christ, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He pointed them to the law. The law is life. Romans 7 verse 10, and the commandment which was ordained to life. Father, to disobey God's law is to reject life and to choose death. Now, my heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You probably have a decision card in your hand. The first choice, I have decided to accept Jesus as my Savior. If that's your decision under the moving of the Spirit, check that. You would like personal counseling, whatever it is that you moved and convicted to do, check it because someone will respond. You may desire to be baptized, you've never been, check that. You may desire to be rebaptized as 12 disciples were rebaptized in Acts chapter 19, check that. You have a prayer request, it's private, or you don't mind writing it, write it on the back of the card. But respond to one of these if you are so convicted. This is a revival series. A revival means to come alive again. Amen. And some of us need to do that. 1 John chapter 2 verse 19 says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that it might be made manifest that they were not of us. There are some people who have been in the church for decades. Not yet converted. Or some for decades need to be reconverted. Whatever your conviction is, you respond. Baptism, rebaptism. I was conducting a weekend revival in a certain country, made a call for rebaptism. 50 people came. I met with them in a room in the church, and a retired minister joined me. And he gave an experience. He said, in the middle of his ministry, he went to his conference president and said, I need to be rebaptized. The president said, Why? He said, I've done nothing. What have you done? He said, Nothing really that would constitute disfellowship, but my life has not grown. I need to be rebaptized. And he was rebaptized in front of his church because there were members of the church who also needed to be reconverted. And rebaptize. Uh, evangelism, page 375, paragraph 2. When a soul is truly reconverted, let that soul be rebaptized. You may have been baptized because someone forced you. You did not understand what you're doing. You need to make a decision now based on an understanding of God's word. Father, let your spirit guide your people to make the right choice. Whatever choice they make, let it glorify your name. And whatever glorifies you, God will bless us. As we leave, let's leave grateful for your law of righteousness, your law of life, the very standard by which Jesus Christ lived. Let us walk with the consciousness that we are children of God, and children of God live at a different level by the power of the Spirit. Let mighty angels protect us as we sleep. Bring us back tomorrow, day, God, to hear your word again. Bless our guests online, Father. Bring them back wherever they are to listen again tomorrow. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name. Let God's people say amen and amen. God bless you as you leave. Don't let the devil take the message out of your mind. Think of what you've heard. Meditate. Let it sink deep, deep into the subconscious. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.